All right. Hello, uh, welcome to the Iowa City Public Library. Uh, today we're doing a um, panel in conjunction with the Big Read. Uh, Big Read is a um, initiative done by the National Endowment for the Arts, trying to restore reading to the center of American culture. Um, and this was uh, applied for by Summer of the Arts, which was um, done in conjunction with the Johnson County's or Libraries of Johnson County. Um, so here at the Iowa City Public Library, we've been doing a few um, programs, and this panel today is Ray Bradbury and his impact on science fiction. Um, today on the panel, we have Jacob Horn, a graduate student at the University of Iowa, and we have Bruce Hepner Elgin, a local filmmaker, and they're going to be our resident experts. And yeah, and definitely we're uh, it's going to be rather informal since it's smaller. We're missing a panel member, but um, we'll we'll talk maybe 30, 45 minutes. And then if um, anyone in the audience has anything they would like to add or any questions, comments, that would be great. Um, so I guess I'm going to just start things off. Um, with something that we have these reader's guides that the National Endowment of the Arts supplied. And in the preface, it says that uh, science fiction first crossed over from genre writing to mainstream uh, American literature when uh, Fahrenheit 451 was released. So um, I'm going to offer to the panel um, uh, how much that's true and not true, or whether or not you agree with that was when science fiction crossed over into mainstream literature. Would you like to start? Or? Um, I, I'll go ahead and start by saying that I actually do disagree a little bit. Um, th there's no arguing with Ray Bradbury's uh, influence on writing and filmmaking and our culture and science fiction as well, but I think that there was, there was quite a uh, history of science fiction being accepted and other, spe other forms of speculative fiction being accepted in mainstream culture well before then. You know, uh, everything from Varney the Vampire um, to um, uh, Jules Verne, you know, H.G. Wells, writers that, that came before and, and had a huge popular impact. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I think that um, it, it kind of is, is a strange thing to say that they, uh, uh, that he broke into mainstream media when, you know, the, at, the, at the time when, when he was getting his start, the pulps were, were, were huge. And, uh, and everyone was reading these strange stories in, in pulp uh, magazines. Um, and he published many of his early short stories in pulps. And so it's sort of odd to say that he's part of mainstream fiction. Um, uh, I don't know, are we doing questions? That Exactly right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Brave New World as an as an early piece. I, I mean, there's a, a number of, of earlier um, texts, including I mean, 1984 is published. You know, six years before or five years before um, um, uh, Fahrenheit 451, and um, and really the Martian Chronicles by Bradbury two years before Fahrenheit 451 is also extremely huge as far as um, getting sort of nationwide critical acclaim as well as sort of popular stuff. So I think determining between, when we, when we say mainstream, do we mean um, the critical appreciation of science fiction or do we mean the, um, the more sort of popular enjoyment of it? I mean, think about Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers and, you know, and people who are just you know, all over the place at this time. So it's kind of a, kind of a tricky question. Although I, I do think that there is something to the argument that he was the first real science fiction writer that was um, believed to be a great writer by literary critics. Yeah, so. yeah. I would say this book is a milestone in literary science fiction, you know, as m main, maybe as opposed to mainstream science fiction. Yeah. And uh, I guess to expand on that, um, him being embraced by uh, literary critics, uh, why do you think that is? Do you think it's the, the social commentary that goes in there? If you just want to expand on that? Well, um, I think definitely part of it is the social commentary. I'm trying to figure out what, um, 
the science fiction writers were talking about was one of the problems that a lot of the literary critics had and didn't have the right words to use. But Bradbury was such a, he, his writing style is much more like what you would expect in a, pop, in, a, in, a, in a more literary popular novel than what you're going to find in, say, Asimov, who is much more about the, the harder, you know, let's talk about logic for a little while and, uh, and you know, why robots do what they do. Um, that's not really Bradbury's focus. He was much more interested in like social and psychological realism, even though his stories tend to be significantly more focused on uh, you know, things that aren't currently real uh, or were not currently real. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I'd, I'd also add in that there was also um, a great history of social commentary in science fiction from the beginning of science fiction writing. That's actually one of its great strengths for any kind of speculative fiction. It, it has the ability to you know, mask social commentary in you know, a more palatable way that doesn't you know, shove it down the, the reader's throat quite as you know, mm. untastily. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, there's a. I, I found a couple of great quotes on this on this act, on this issue exactly. Um, uh, one is from uh, uh, Kingsley Amos, one of the, the the great literary critics and writers of the, the first half of the 20th century. He said uh, that Bradbury is a good writer, wider in range than any of his colleagues, capable of seeing life on another planet as something extraordinary instead of just challenging or horrific. Um, and so you can see from that, I think, that there's this focus on. His, his ability to see people in science fiction instead of just seeing the science in science fiction. And um, to touch on the, the issue of the um, making comment uh, or being social commentary in science fiction, Bradbury also said that, um, this is in an interview that he did in 1975, he said, during the McCarthy reign of terror, I wrote a novel titled Fahrenheit 451, which was a direct attack on the kind of thought-destroying force he, uh, McCarthy, represented in the world. Yet few people attack me for writing an anti-McCarthy novel. Obviously, because it is science fiction, they haven't gotten the message that I meant all kinds of tyrannies anywhere in the world at any time. So there's something really interesting about how sci-fi can both critique but also sort of hide. Um, and I think from Verne to Wells, you're, you're already seeing this. Olaf Stapledon also doing this in uh, Last and First Men and Star Maker are, are both excellent examinations of sci-fi having a social message. So. Mm -hmm. I, I think that really why it was accepted you know, in literary circles was because of Bradbury's mastery of the craft. You know, there, there were quite a uh, you know, large number of other science fiction off authors out there at the time. I'm a huge Heinlein fan. But, you know, when you compare a, a, a Robert Heinlein novel with a Bradbury novel, it's a pretty different flavor you get. And, and this, is some, you know, this is something that can be looked at as literature, you know, the big L literature, probably, a, you know, a lot more easily than, you know, your average Heinlein novel. The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, great, but not, yeah, yeah. not in the same category yeah. as this yeah. category. Well written, but not necessarily great writing, wh whatever that is. <laughs> so um, I guess their claim that he crossed over into mainstream American literature, more the, the poetry of his writing, for, uh, for lack of a better word, yeah. um, uh, it's much more approachable than the hard science fiction. Where yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look through this book, there's these beautiful segments where he just uh, where he goes on these um, extended metaphors and it just examines these materials. I mean, rel relatively early on, when Guy Montag comes home, he sees his wife's face in the uh, in the darkened room, and there's a, an extended metaphor about how the, her her face is as, as as blank as a clock, and it's just there's just nothing there except the passage of time and. That's something that, I mean, I, I, I love Heinlein. I'm, I'm right there with you, but you're not going to find that in Heinlein's books. You're not going to find that in Asimov, even. Um, they're much more interested in the particularities of, of sci-fi um, as it relates to technology and the advancement of science in a certain way. Um, in fact, that actually made um, Bradbury a, a pariah in a lot of ways in the science fiction community. Um, he was often referred to as the science fiction writer who didn't write science fiction. He was <laughs> writing other things. and. Uh, um, when uh, some of the uh, critics in the 50s and early 60s, one of them said something to the effect of, um, he's a great writer and maybe someday he'll write some science fiction. Um, and, and so I mean, yeah. you can see uh, there's, a, there's a tension here where if you go that far and you do this beautiful work, um, 
whether people will continue to believe that this is a actually a science fiction novel or, or if it's just fiction. I mean, where where do you find the shell at the at, you know the library or Barnes and Noble or something? You know, is this in a science fiction section or is this in literature? I mean, I think that's a, a fair hopefully both. problem. Yeah, I mean, one would hope. But, yeah. 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 As a um, note, we have it in science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I love Bradbury's quote that Fahrenheit 451 is the only science fiction novel that he ever wrote. Mm -hmm. That you know everything else was essentially fantasy because science fiction is about what can really happen. And to, the, to him, this social science fiction is something that really could happen, whereas everything else was essentially a flight of fantasy for mm -hmm. him. And uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that he's a, uh, he said it was science fiction writer. Um, can't remember who said, but he, he's a great writer. It'd be nice if he wrote some science fiction. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah. it was, uh, I wrote him down, Edward Wood. Edward in Wood. 1951. Um, I came across when I was reading stuff about him that I didn't realize this, but he's a technophobe. But after I, I read that, that made sense. Um, so, and one of the things, he'd never driven a car. And I thought that was interesting then in Fahrenheit 451 where he has the, the jet cars, yeah, yeah. where I think that's kind of um, shows his, his fear, almost fear of driving, where mm -hmm. that might be what it is to him, these jet cars that are racing along yeah. even now. But um, with, um, there was an interview with him and he was talking about science fiction and the question was, what is it about society that may explain why some people embrace future possibilities introduced in science fiction as plausible, while others remain skeptical until they actually see humanity's breakthroughs? And his response was, well, science fiction is very helpful, but it doesn't sink in with the average person. It never has, and I don't suppose it ever will. How true or not true do you think that is? I think it sinks in plenty. You know, maybe not to the to the the depths that Bradbury wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, if people didn't catch that the book was about McCarthyism, and, and you know, when I read it, I certainly wasn't thinking about McCarthy when I read it. You know, I think there's there's plenty of other forms of oppression and censorship that really come to my mind before McCarthyism. Maybe I'm just too removed from that. You know, but I I think uh, I think science fiction sinks in very well for a lot of people. I think it it's, it continues moving forward too. I, I think. At Bradbury, when Bradbury was writing his um, his classic novels, I mean, he's still writing today. I mean, I, uh, he was in the the comic convention in San Diego, yeah. the, the Comic Con yeah. just this year, and, and you know had a panel about his new stuff that he's working on. So he's still writing, he's still doing stuff. Um, uh, but I think that the the general perception of the um, uh, American culture, especially and likely just you know, cultures around the world, is that science fiction seems more possible. These days, and uh, in a lot of ways, it's um, you know if we woke up tomorrow and uh, this is uh, I think is it Bruce Sterling said this if we woke up tomorrow and uh, it turned out that there was um, someone had cloned someone successfully, um, we would not be surprised. None of us would be like, oh my gosh, cloning! Wow, mm -hmm. um, it, we're we're all so yeah. completely imbricated in technology at this point that you know we're just we await these new things uh, and expect them to be happening all the time, and so. In a strange way, I'm not. I I, I think you know, he might be a little bit behind the curve on that, um, and we're much more ready now to admit of the possibilities of science fiction. Yeah, and I think it's a combination of the exponential, you know, speed of technological growth that we're going through, um, and combined with the prevalence of science fiction within our culture, science fiction and speculative fiction. Um, you know, it, both in, in terms of literature and, you know, film and television, we're surrounded by it. And so, you know, the, the ideas are not a surprise anymore. Perhaps, perhaps it loses a bit of its novelty, you know, which might be a sad thing. And, um, you know, writers of science fiction are forced to, you know, either go into something more shocking or, you know, or, or you know, perhaps go to the, to the social roots of science fiction. But um, yeah, I don't think I don't think it's too I mean, new of a thing. There was a popular novel last year, the year before, The Time Traveler's Wife. I mean, yeah. The, yeah. I think you know the fact that you can have a, a, a popular piece of, of literature um, where a, a time traveling main character is, is one of the central concerns of the text is is. 
fascinating, and I, I'm reasonably certain that's not shelved in science fiction. Right, sure. Yeah, it's about the, that we have that in our fiction collection. <laughs> so so I mean, it's, it's, the bleed is really interesting, and it, it reflects a lot about the way our society tends to think about these things and, and how, we've, how we've moved forward. And so, yeah, I, I, think, I think there's a lot to be said for the, um, the, the popular ability to um, absorb the possibilities of science mm -hmm. fiction. But having said that we put that in fiction, do you think that there is still maybe a stigma connected to science fiction, where if we shelve that in science fiction, that maybe a certain readership wouldn't get a hold of it just because that's where we place it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, genre is always stigmatized, right? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily matter what genre it is. And so the minute that you say this is science fiction, then everyone has a whole set of preconceived notions about what it, what it will actually entail. Um, and so... You know, that's why in some ways I think people resist calling Fahrenheit 451 science fiction because they don't want people to come into it with this set of, oh, this is just a crazy story of technology gone awry or something. Um, uh, this couldn't really happen or something uh, along those lines. Um, and, uh, and so that, that stigma, I think it still persists even if it's not as strong as it once was. Um, and it shifts to different kinds of science fiction now. You know, you tell someone that you're reading Greg Bear and hard yeah. sci-fi <laughs> stuff, yeah. um, then that's very different from saying that you're reading Bradbury or, or even Heinlein maybe at this point. But uh, I mean, it, it's a, it has a different feel to it. Um, and, and the stigma, I think, is ridiculous because everything's genre, really. You know, what, what, what is you know, literary fiction other than the drama genre, generally? Mm -hmm. You know, it, everything is a genre of one sort or other. Michael Chabon wrote a, a, an essay where he talks about the, the origins of the, the, the realist novel as be becoming sort of literature and why this particular form of writing somehow has become yeah. the, the best, you know, the highest form of writing that anyone can do these days. Yeah. Um, and he, he sort of posits a strange world in which the, uh, the nurse drama became the highest form of, uh, <laughs> of, of literature. And what that would look like today, you know, and why, why is it that this one particular way of writing is now the most sort of popular um, and the most well-regarded as well um, is an interesting question. You know? and, and so think about it in terms of everything being a genre is, is probably true. You know? I mean, when we pick up the latest bestseller in the New York Times, we're fitting it into a whole set of preconceived uh, um, uh, ideas about what you know, national best-selling fiction texts are. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so. uh, you know, I, Cormac McCarthy's The oh, Road yeah. is apocalyptic science fiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's this close to Mad Max, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that he writes fancy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be our new definition. Do you write fancy? Yeah. Bradbury <laughs> and yeah. McCarthy. You know, otherwise, yeah. And, yeah, you get shuffled off into the genre prison. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> kind of going with um, this idea of mainstream, well, not necessarily mainstream, but kind of mainstream, but I'd say contemporary science fiction. Mm -hmm. um, I was kind of thinking... Uh, I pulled this quote from uh, Ray Bradbury, and he's talking about um, special effects. And here's a quote. Uh, when I lectured to a group of special effects people a few years ago, I witnessed two hours of their technical expertise before going on to speak. I then said to them, I love fireworks as much as anyone else in this world. My idea of something great is being in Paris, July 14, each year by the Eiffel Tower and seeing the explosions of brilliant color and celestial constellations put up by the fireworks people. The problem is when the wind blows, the fire is swept away. The color is gone from the clouds and the sky is empty. What you people have done and are doing is fireworks, which I love, but there is no content. There is nothing there when the wind blows. Um, so I guess well, my question yeah. is, what do you think he thinks of contemporary science fiction when I guess maybe the um, the idea of popular science fiction right now is the spectacle and the special effects. And I'm not going to name names of popular movies recently, but Avatar. <laughs> Avatar, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it would be difficult to have the conversation without that. Do you want to... I, I, I actually think that there is more than just fireworks to Avatar. You know, yes, it's a story we've all seen hundreds of times, but the story is there. 
you know, and it is, it's presented in such a gorgeous way, you know, that you're willing to sit through it and say, yeah, you know, I've seen that story before, but it sure got me at that point, you know. Um, please, please go on. No, I, yeah. I'm, I'm willing to agree to a point, but there's, I, I'm kind of, I, 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 don't, I don't want to put words in Bradbury's mouth, and so I'm not sure that it would be fair for me to say that he would like it or he would dislike it. Uh, he probably has written something about it. Um, he's so prolific. Uh, but I think most of what he has focused on in his career is how the, the technological changes um, affect the way that humans interact. Um, and, and so you, know, you look at like the, the, the little earwigs or whatever they're called in the, uh, in the, the seashells, that's what they are, the, uh, in, the, um, in 451, and you see him looking at those and thinking of how they're, how they're preventing people from contacting each other. And then, of course, immediately I started thinking about people walking down the street with their iPod in and he not He tells a story about that. Exactly. You know, I mean, these things sort of come up um, sort of... Uh, and for him, it's about that moment on the street when you see the person coming toward you and they don't seem to, to see you as a person. Whereas, you know, I'm not sure that um, you know, he would find the, the current stories as interesting because of their lack of focus on that character, their lack of interest in those, those moments that, that change people. You know, I mean, there's something sort of strange, and I don't, I don't want to beat up Avatar or anything. Um, it certainly made a lot of money. Um, but uh, I, you know, there's all of these incredible technological differences between their world and our world, but somehow the story is transposable. And I wonder why that is. I wonder what it is that, that hasn't changed for them, that the technology hasn't affected in some way, and why that would be. I mean, I can't imagine what life would be like if we, if we had the ability to, to, to actually travel from one star system to another. I can't even envision what kinds of strange things that would do to the human subconscious, if not the conscious mind. Um, and so for me, there's something that I think Bradbury would be much more sort of like, hmm, what, is, what, is, what does that do to us? What does it mean that we go to sleep for months and wake up in a completely different place with a completely different set of... Uh, uh, of life around us, um, and uh, and so you know, I, I think there's something there, and I think that it's interesting that this story is so you know, repeatable, transferable, whatever we want to call it. But at the same time, I think Bradbury would be would interrogate that a little more closely um, to see how it might change people. Um, yeah, um, I think there's always been. Sloppy storytelling, sloppy, <laughs> lazy storytelling. Especially you know, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and in, in you know before Bradbury and during Bradbury's day, um, there were you know thousands upon thousands of science fiction novels written, maybe published, that were completely forgotten about because they were essentially lazy. I mean, the pulps are are oftentimes <laughs> about that, and, and the pulps have become you know cheap bad movies. You know, maybe they're not cheap financially, but, <laughs> but you know, emotionally they're cheap. And, you know, they, they leave us wanting. And I, I think um, that James Cameron is an expert at manipulating his audience in the way that he wants to. And I think that's, that's one of his successes, is that he does plug in some meaning. There's a message there. And, and I think that's part of what's transportable. Um, and, and I love I love your point about you know the you know transporting us to a new world and new circumstances, and because I mean it, unfortunately <laughs> you know in that particular story in Avatar there's no time to go into that because he chose a different focus, mm -hmm. but you know but say Philip Pullman in mm -hmm. his trilogy his Dark Materials the Golden Compass series um, does go into that about the impact of being someplace that you're not supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and the, the two main characters at the end of the third book are separated because they do come from different, you know, different worlds and they can't be together. And and yeah, there, there's so there's so many wonderful avenues and uh, and I think that's one of the, the special gifts of social science fiction like 451. Because you know we get to look more at our interior, you know, and the possibilities that we have there. 
sorry, I didn't mean to beat up on Avatar. No, no, it no. It came as no. a good example of recent. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Spe- yeah. Er, spectacle in science fiction. Um, uh, coming back to Fahrenheit 451, um, it's definitely a, a great example of speculative fiction. If yeah, you, you know. Um, speaking specifically about science fiction and its ability to predict. So um, there's an interview in this reader's guide, and the question was, decades after Fahrenheit 451, do you feel that you predicted the world in that sense fairly accurately? And his response is interesting. goes, oh, God, I never believed in prediction. That's other people's business. Someone like H.G. Wells with The Shape of Things to Come. I've said it often. I've tried not to predict, but to protect and to prevent. If I can convince people to stop doing what they're doing and go to the library and be sensible without pontificating and without being self-conscious, that's fine. I can teach people to really know they're alive. Um, How how far do you think he succeeded or not succeeded in doing that with Fahrenheit 451? Well, first on, on prediction, you mentioned the seashells and, you know, turning into uh, iPods and things like that. I think that's actually one of the, the very few successful predictions that science fiction has ever come up with. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think the uh, prediction of radar by Heinlein, wasn't it? Uh, it was uh, Gernsback. Gernsback, okay. Gernsback, yeah, yeah well, was one of the, the, the very few others. Everything else, they've been pretty far off the mark. You know, great ideas, but, yeah. 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 That's here. Oh, yeah. I know that that's some talk about so much invasion in the world, but with uh, Red Berry Rules. Yeah. There's a a fair number of interesting sort of predictive moments in the text, and one of them that I I, want to point at is the the moment where um, the, he talks about the presidential race. Early on, uh, in yeah. like ninety six to ninety seven in my text, <laughs> yeah. and he talks about you know um, I voted the, the the lady that's come to visit. I voted uh, last election same as everyone, and I laid it on the line for President Noble. I think he's one of the nicest looking men ever became president. Um, and then the other guy doesn't look as nice, you know. And this is nineteen fifty three. It's seven years before the Kennedy Nixon debates, mm-hmm. um, where Kennedy looks so much better than Nixon on camera. And, yeah. uh, and there's their, you know, it's, it's not clear whether that's why he wins at this point, but it's definitely clear that the people who saw the debate thought that Kennedy won, and the people who heard the debate thought that Nixon won. Um, and so this, this idea of the, the, the visual appearance of the, uh, of the candidates becoming a central concern in political races um, is, is fascinating. Um, the omnipresent media, I mean, the constantly talking to people. Um, heck, he even sort of vaguely presages like the O.J. Simpson car chase, right? With the yeah. televisions all yeah. looking at the, the, yeah. the, the yeah, Montag running through the uh, through the night, you know, and uh, waiting for the for the cops or the, the the electric hound to catch up to him, you know. And so, I mean, it, it, it does touch on these weird sort of moments that that seem sort of real now. They seem like we're 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 sort of there. Um, but I'm willing to, to totally agree with Bradbury's statement that, that he's not actually trying to predict these things. I don't think he's actually setting himself up as a, a sort of a mid-20th century Nostradamus in any way, shape, or form. I think he's just looking at the technology and thinking about it and seeing what some possible outcomes could be. There's other stuff in here that he predicts that we don't really do and that, that it's totally not at all correct. Um, the fact that this one seems to have these strange moments of resonance with the modern world is, uh, is potentially one of the reasons why it's stuck around so long um, and why we're still as interested in it. So, yeah. uh, and, and for the second half of Brian's question, is it successful in preventing? Oh, gosh, that's a tough question. Because, you know, um, he, he was probably disappointed because people didn't pick up on the anti-McCarthy um, you know, uh, message there. Is, is any effort like that directly responsible for an intervention? I don't know. Um, I'm feeling a little cynical and I'm thinking maybe not. Uh, I, I don't want to think that. I, I want to think that, that, you know, writers can have in impact and can make a direct difference. And, and I think that they do on a microscopic scale. They, they do for individuals, but for society, 
I don't know, maybe society is this, you know, slow moving kind of sightless behemoth that, that you can't really steer, that it's on its own course. And, and like Bradbury says, that, you know, the cycle will come around and they'll need us again. They'll, you know, they, they'll need the books again and then they'll destroy it all. But then we'll start all over again. And hopefully every time we'll remember a little bit more. Um, I think he's definitely made that small impact where there's a few more people remembering. I mean, pred predictive power and the ability to change is tricky, right? I mean, it's all a feedback loop. Yeah. Because once you've said it, then it's in the popular consciousness. And mm -hmm. does that make it a, a self-fulfilling prophecy? In fact, one of the sort of jokes around was that the, uh, um, the seashells inspired Sony to make the Walkman. Um, and uh, no one has ever proven this or said that it's, a, but you, know, you can see, the, you, can see the, you can trace the lineage. It's interesting. You know, it appears there, and then it starts appearing elsewhere. Um, I just hope it didn't then, inspire somebody to make more flamethrowers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, uh, actually, I think Rod Serling apologized to to the United States because uh, it was on the Twilight Zone. It was the first place that um, the idea of hijacking a plane was ever uh, was ever put forward. Mm. And so um, there are these moments, but at the same time, you know, you also have things like the jungle. Right, where the, the meatpacking industry in Chicago is this horrible place, and Upton Sinclair comes in and actually writes something that does get things changed. Right? This is a slightly different case, right? Because it's not, you know, it's a current problem that he addresses and then gets sort of fixed um, instead of. Um, and, yeah, uh, Did we get close to that? <laughs> well, I, I certainly don't want to suggest that it's completely repaired, but I, I would say that the, 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 the situation is, is in many ways improved. Um, the, uh, but the, the problem is that that was a, a, an actually ongoing thing, and he's talking about things that haven't started yet. And so if you're, <laughs> are you telling people that this is a possibility to prepare them so that it won't happen? Um, and if so, that's a very strange way of going about it. There's a, you know, an extremely large number of possible futures. Um, uh, and so then how do you prepare everyone against all of them, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a strange problem. But I think there's something in that preventative sense. You know? um, all utopian and dystopian fiction boils down to the attempt to um, posit some change to the world and how that would improve or, or harm it. And um, as a dystopian text, he's looking at how the world is harmed by the absence of certain kinds of books. Um, not all books, which I thought was fascinating, but certain mm, kinds yeah. of books. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and how that, that changes the, the world in an interesting way. Um, yeah, but, I mean, it's the same thing that Huxley's working on, that Orwell's working with. You know, everyone, they, they, they find this thing and they twist it just enough so they can see what would, what would happen. Um, and, I mean, and science fiction writers today are actually considering these things as well. When you look at the uh, fields like nanotechnology um, and these extremely sort of small changes that are being made, um, and writers are starting to think about, well, what happens if you make these changes? What happens when we start mass producing things on, on the microscopic scale? Um, and they're looking into it in a way that, uh, you know, that scientists are not always willing or capable of doing. Um, and so the, the, the ability for uh, um, science fiction to play with these ideas outside of the realm of the, the actual real work that's being done is, um, I think, a useful way to think about stuff. I mean, no one's ever going to think about artificial intelligence in the same way after seeing 2001 or, you know, Terminator, I suppose, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, it's a very it's, yeah, it's the more popular version right. of yeah. you know of the machine, you yeah. know, you gaining Star life. Trek, the original Star Trek really did a lot of what you're talking about, oh. of course. The humanity, the concept of art, what we know, and these visitations to new, new and unexplored places, and it, seeing alternative worlds, and, and yet keeping you know the human problems right. paramount. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I completely agree. I think that the, the way that Star Trek was able to bridge those gaps makes it one of the most you know, interesting you know, cultural events of the, of the 20th century. And Ren Bradbury thought that Star Trek was really fascinating. And uh, he went to lecture in the 
um, the, the late 60s and early 70s in, uh, in uh, colleges in California, and there would be Star Trek groups that he would meet with that wanted to talk to him about his ideas and science fiction. And he thought this was an extremely positive development. So you know, I, I certainly don't mean to suggest that there's no positive way to do these things, um, but, but that, you know, on the whole. <laughs> well, it's, it, 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 I, I think that there's something special about, about fiction and literature you know, whether it be in print or whether it be in film or, or, you know, just about anything. Because it has the ability to present a message, you know, through, through art that you couldn't get just by Ray Bradbury getting up on a show, soapbox and shouting about it. And, and it's also very, very necessary because as science replaces religion as the, the dominant operating system in not only our country but our whole world, empiricism shows a terrible weakness in that it has no conscience and you know it has no it, it absolutely denies any interior element which is absolutely vital for human life and for the continuation of any life you know if if science is allowed to continue without you know the Bradbury's out there speaking about okay this is really dangerous this is what will happen you know, this is what will happen to us if, you know, it, then, you know, we get unchecked global warming, we get, you know, more and more incredible bombs because we can make them, because, hey, let's figure out how to do it. But fiction tells us what's good and what's bad about that. It gives value to it. Yeah, to an interior life. Yeah. yeah. But, it, but it brings that forward in the very beginning of the book where he meets the young woman who yeah. is so audacious as to look up at the natural world and who's the, uh, the chief, I guess it was, who, the fire chief who explains uh, of the families talking, you know, the families actually talk. Yeah. And, and yeah. They have this thing called the porch. Right. Yep. You know, the community. Yep. The community. And, and it's and I'm just, I, it always makes me think about, uh, I, you know, the condos where, or the houses now where you go right into the garage and close the door behind you and you never have to see anybody again. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, that's, and that's being continued. Uh, uh, John Michael Straczynski. Um, have you, uh, has anybody else read the, uh, the comic book, Rising Stars? Mm -hmm. Rising Stars. Yeah, Rising Stars. <laughs> you know, a fantastic comic book. And, and he makes that same comment about, you know, the need for community. You know, in the very end, people start to reclaim their porches, you know, in order to see what's going on in their community. Yeah. One thing I would like to add to this that I think is really fascinating in, in terms of is that Bradbury suggests these things, but he doesn't, I mean, and he himself states in other interviews and in the book that he doesn't want to be a, a pedant. You know, he doesn't want to be standing up there and telling you what's right. right. And in fact, there's this really interesting thread throughout the whole book of um, how he's unwilling to guarantee that this will fix anything. And I really appreciate his, his, the, the subtlety of that message because it, it seems to suggest that there's something beyond just being able to say, well, you know, if we do this, everything will be okay. Um, that, 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 that's, that's not possible, that you can't say, well, if we all memorize all these books and we're ready when everything goes to hell, we can step up and fix it. Um, <laughs> yeah. He said, well, this is just what we believe we'll be able to do. And uh, both the, um, the English professor Faber and the, I'm trying to remember the, the other man he meets in the, in the forest who speaks with him. Um, um, Oh, my notes are all messed up. Um, but uh, in, in any case, that, that man also says, you know, I can't guarantee it. Both of them say, I can't guarantee that this is going to make the world a better place. But I believe that it will. And, and he sort of throws it back to personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. Step up to the plate and be accountable, take responsibility for this, and then hopefully that will, will help. Mm -hmm. 
It's, a, it's an extremely interesting ethical and moral message that, uh, that it's, it's tough to face, though, that it's not necessarily going to be, make everything better and that it's not necessarily going to make your life any better either. Um, and, and hopefully you'll be more satisfied. Yeah. That seems to be the you're, central. You're a witness to a different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that you mention that, and it's true, he doesn't guarantee that this is going to work because um, in uh, his book, he has a book of essays called Bradbury Speaks, and a friend of his suggested a sequel to Fahrenheit 451, <laughs> and what, he, what his friend put forth was, um, so in it, the wilderness people memorize all the great books so that they're hidden between their ears, and his friend was fascinated by this, and he goes, why not in the sequel to Fahrenheit 451, in which all the great books are remembered by the wilderness people, and are finally reprinted from memory, what then? Wouldn't it be, he continued, that all would be misremembered, none would come forth in their original garb, wouldn't they <laughs> be longer, shorter, taller, fatter, disfigured, or more beautiful? Instead of angels in the alcove, might they be gargoyles off the roof? And I just thought that was really interesting, you know. Um, so these people are remembering these books, but they're, they're going to put themselves into that, the book, and they're going to... It's not going to come out the same way. Well, but, but Bradbury does address that in the book. You know, he talks about how, you know, none of the individuals are important, that, you know, that it's, you know, that interior thing that they're holding. And he also vaguely mentions some kind of mental technology that they have to, you know, retrieve verbatim anything that anybody's ever glanced at. I mean, that's a pretty amazing, you know. I, I don't want them to invent that right. ever. You know, um, yeah, but he, he tries to solve that problem a little bit, but at yeah. the same time, I, I think that would be an interesting. You know, you can see where Bradbury might find that to be an exciting direction to take the the material as well to say, well, yeah, well, what if they don't quite remember Hamlet right? Yeah. You know, what if what if uh, you know they remember it that it turns out that Gertrude is the one that poisons Claudius? You know, or just <laughs> yeah. you know, what does that? How does that change things for us? You know, what I mean, and, and that kind of subtle distinctions or subtle you know memory lapses um, could be interesting to trace out potentially. Um, yeah. I mean, especially if we're going to argue, as he does, that um, literature is so important to us. What happens if it's not the literature that we had, but a new literature? Well, that's um, why a lot of modern writers will take a story like Moby Dick and then write a novel called Ahab's Wife. Yeah. You yeah. Know, just change the whole focus of what, the, what was really going on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm reading Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, this is a this is a long tradition. I mean, artists talking back to each other, continuing yeah. to expand on the works that others have done. Sometimes critically, sometimes comedically. Um, you know, it's a, it's an interesting. You know, it's interesting to me personally, uh, and in my studies that I'm working on, to see when this happens and for what reasons it's done. You know, um, often the, it gets it gets done for reasons uh, like revisionary reasons. I, I, you know, in Jane Eyre, you have the mad woman living in the attic, and then you have White Sargasso's Sea, which explains where she came from and tries to really unpack that because she was just a a um, you know, mad woman from the from the Caribbean and. Uh, Exactly, exactly. And so then you get this, this attempt to reclaim that woman and say, you know, well, she wasn't just a mad woman in an attic. She, went, she, went, she had a life. And, and that's a very different program from what you know, the Bronte sisters were up to. And, uh, yeah. and so bringing it back had a very, it, it was done for a very specific reason. And, uh, and so bringing these other things back and rewriting them and tweaking them in different ways, everything from the new Sherlock Holmes movie to um, and Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, you know, that why do we do this? What components are we, are we retaining and what components are we letting go and why? Um, it's all a big conversation. Mm -hmm. okay. um, we have about 15 minutes left. I'll open it up to questions or comments from the audience. And I just realized I don't have a mic to give people in the audience. Um, <laughs> but I can repeat any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Never mind. I do have a mic. Ask for wow. it, and it appears. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, it seems like, well, 
this whole community reading project is funded by the National Endowment for the Arts NEA Big Read. And the reason that the NEA Big Read started was because there's a worry that people aren't reading and that people are moving away from the written word as a central part of their lives. And so and one of the terms that they use is lapsed readers. And so it sort of seems like Fahrenheit 451 in some ways is sort of a metaphor for this. And so in some ways I think it's a pretty appropriate book that our community chose. Now I don't see this so much in our community, we're, you know, we're, we're a very educated community, community of readers, but I wonder if you could respond to um, you know, how people are not reading and if you think that projects like this make a difference. I've had, I've had a, a long worry that perhaps literacy was a blip on our cultural timeline. You know, that popular reading is really only a couple of hundred years old. You know, when mass market um, printing became feasible. You know, before then it was the, the purview of the, the rich, of the elite, those who could afford books, those who could afford the time to learn how to read. And is it being replaced? You know, in Fahrenheit 451, it has been replaced by television and radio. You know, and oh, and you know, it's obviously a sadder world for it. And is it being replaced now by the web, where you know, yes, you do have to be able to read, but you don't have to be able to pull meaning from words the way that you do if you have to read this book. If you if you don't have the skills as a reader to pull meaning from this book, it's a horrible book. It's like, why is he repeating these numbers 15 times in a row? I don't get it, you know? And, but if, if you have the training and the support, you know, and the patience to learn to gather meaning from what you read, this is amazing. So, oof. I'm, this is where I'm not going to be cynical because I think, I think that there is hope. I think that there is enough really good literature out there. It really ticked me off when Oprah stopped doing her book club for a while because she said that there, didn't she say that the, there wasn't, you know, enough good literature to read or something like that? I, don't I, I remember something along those lines, but I don't remember exactly what she said. But yeah, she said something about there not being the right kind of book. Yeah, Maybe, oh I'm boy. Sure, but oh boy, that, that ticked me off when, when that happened. If Oprah you know? sees this, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm the one who said it, don't worry. Um, because, you know, she was in, in a position where she really was encouraging thousands and thousands of people to read. Mm -hmm. and, and it worked, you know. And then, you know, she stopped and she cut the legs out from under that. That's a, that's a horrible thing to do. I think, I think we have responsibility to encourage others whenever we possibly can because it is such a vital thing and it has made our culture possible. We could not have had you know, the advancement of technology without widespread literacy. You know, we could not have had you know, a society that we have without the ability to pull meaning from books. It's been probably the greatest single leveling factor in the history of humankind. I, I, you know, I have a lot of mixed concerns with this. I do study literature, <laughs> and so I find that you know, I'm much more sort of invested in it uh, in a lot of ways yeah. because of that. Um, uh, but at the same time, you know, Bradbury, um, he, you know, he sort of castigates um, television and radio in this, but in other places he says that, that they're just different media with different um, rules to learn. And once you know them, then you can um, you can create stories as good as anything that literature can do. Um, and so, on the one hand, I, I do sort of lament the the, the you know, disappearing readership in the United States, um, and I am sort of sad that Oprah is no longer having her her book club and uh, and doing the. I mean, she she literally had like like classes with Toni Morrison yeah. leading them. You know, I mean, that's yeah. that's, that's crazy. Well, she did start um, again, didn't she? 
Um, I think so. I think she did start again after a while. Say you're one, say you're one of them. Oh, I think yeah, is her yeah. most recent one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that there that there is some you know attempt to continue this. Um, uh, but I, I do think that there are other avenues for sort of creative work. I, I mean, and analysis can come in a lot of different ways. Um, the the book itself, I think, isn't going to completely disappear. Um, I, I think it's yeah. you know too much a component of everything that we're doing. It might change formats in certain ways. It might end up being more you know, electronic reading than uh, I mean, we've got all our ebook readers all over the place now. Um, but I do think that there will be more um, uh, you know, more attention on other media as well. In fact, when we were waiting here to get started, we were discussing how it sort of feels like we're in kind of the golden era of television um, with all these brilliant television series that are complex yeah. and engaging, like The Wire. Um, oh. It's just amazing. And yeah. I, I mean, and that's something that you could potentially do with literature, but it would have to be very different. And so the way that it's able to marshal all of its um, different abilities to get across its own story, I think is, um, is as interesting as any of the, the current novel writing um, that's going on. I don't know. I, I realize that's kind of a long, rambling answer that didn't really say much. But I, I think there is. I think reading will stick around. I, I think analysis will will remain in different areas as well. Though, so yeah. no, I think it, it's true what you said that you know Bradbury was what his main point was content. That whatever it is that it has content in it, there is like a lack of a better way to put it. Out, there's there's something for you to chew on to yeah. think about, and then yeah. that you have the time afterwards to reflect on it. So it was, and I think even if it's television, you know, stuff like The Wire, you know, a lot of stuff that HBO puts out seems like it's the the literature of television with yeah. the big L. Yeah. So I mean, if people are watching The Wire and discussing it as someone would, you know, a book group would get together and discuss a book. I mean, I still feel like that that's the same thing happening as long as there's that analysis and that there's something to analyze. Mm -hmm. So, any other questions? We're getting close here to the end. You use the phrase speculative fiction mm -hmm. as opposed to science fiction. Could you define that? What's the difference? <laughs> uh, I, 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 r real quick, I was listening to NPR one day, year, like probably 10, 12 years ago, and Harlan Ellison. Um, was going to be interviewed on, um, I, I, forget, I forget exactly which program it was, but boy, it was something else. Because the, the interviewer, I think it was Noah Adams, was, uh, said science fiction once. And, and Harlan Ellison was like, no, I don't write science fiction. I write speculative fiction. And, and the interviewer was like, uh, okay. Well, okay, so we've got this. They go on, they talk for another, another two, three minutes, and he says science fiction again. And Ellison says, no, I write speculative fiction. If you say science fiction one more time, I'm leaving. So what does the interviewer do? He says science fiction. Boom, in the middle of the interview, about five or six minutes into this hour-long interview, Harlan Ellison pulls off his microphone, you can hear it, and he gets up and he walks out. And they have to totally change the program and just talk about Harlan Ellison after that. I don't, I don't really know if there's too much of a difference. Well, I, I actually am willing to step into this minefield. Um, I do not like the title Speculative Fiction. And I know Harlan Ellison likes it. He's also an extremely irascible man. And so, <laughs> yeah. um, so the fact that he walked out after someone uh, annoyed him too much is not in any way surprising to me, although that would have been awesome to hear. Um, uh, he, I don't, uh, anyway, Speculative Fiction for me People often say, well, we should call it speculative fiction and not science fiction because what you're doing is you're speculating about possibilities. Um, and we don't want to limit it to just you know, science fiction, speculative fiction, then you get some fantasy, you get some other yeah. stuff in there. Um, but I, I find, I mean, isn't all fiction speculative? I mean, doesn't all fiction assume that there is some other thing that's happening that's not true and we're going to speculate about it for a little while? Yeah. So I don't know. I find it to be a, a, a potentially... The tautological uh, 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 phrase. And, and so I, I'm, I am willing to go with science fiction. Now, the really hardcore science fiction people don't like to call it science fiction either. They want to call it SF. 
and uh, if, uh, because yeah. then it doesn't have the same sort of genre connotations anymore. So if you go to uh, um, uh, academics talking about science fiction at certain um, conferences, they will call it SF a lot. And if you call it science fiction or sci-fi, God help you. Yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, they no, it's SF. We want to distinguish from the the, the sort of the lowbrow, you know, Halo novels that people are writing <laughs> um, to uh, uh, from you know the actual Bradbury, and uh, and so I I find it sort of odd that we have to bother with all the categorization and you know construction of hierarchies because it seems like you know we've always been in a, a strange sort of sci-fi ghetto of some sort, and I, I don't see why we can't embrace the fact that we have all these weird preconceived notions about it and move forward from there rather than trying to find a new term. And come on, the Sci-Fi Channel just changed their name to SYFY. I know. That, that I know. kills me. I mean, I know. why would you do that? It doesn't make yeah. any sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I don't know. Yeah. And it, to me, it's all, it's all semantics. Mm -hmm. And what they don't understand, all those people who get in these big semantic arguments, they don't understand that everybody knows what they're talking about anyway. <laughs> you know, and that they're really, they just sound dumb. You know, they're being ridiculous. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. I'm not a speculative fiction fan. We'll just call it that. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Got it. I guess this is more of a comment than a question. Is you talked about how people didn't pick up, pick up on um, the McCarthyism in Fahrenheit 451, which would probably be for the best because it could have killed his career. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, so many directors in Hollywood would try to make comments about McCarthyism, and they no longer had work. And Bradbury was quite young when he wrote for Fahrenheit 451. He got lofted his lost his livelihood and worked as a janitor the rest of his life. Absolutely. And in fact, yeah. it, the, one of the reasons why no one saw it as, as a potential commentary was because they had just gotten through with World War II, where Hitler had been burning books. Mm. And so they looked at it and they said, ah, he's talking about Hitler. And, uh, and so he was able to sort of slip under the radar uh, with that. However, it was also published in Russia in the 60s. And, uh, um, and he said that it, he, Bradbury thought it was fascinating that, that you know, um, the, the, the Russian publishing you know, censors were allowing his book to be written in this place uh, uh, with such limited freedoms regarding what you can read. Um, uh, so it, it's strange how, how that text has managed to slide under a lot of radars of more censor-oriented groups or... Uh, and, and I think part of that is in, is in the strength of the writing in that he's able to convince you that he's talking about how things could be with those other people who are doing things wrong. You know, and so, you know, the, the Soviets thought, oh, this is a book about what America is doing wrong. You know, because, because of all that American media and all the, you know, the, 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 the decadence of America is taking over, and we're the, we're the purists who you know who remember our our history, you know, and you know, and and everybody gets to interpret it differently. I think that's one of the, the great things about literature is that you can invest more of yourself in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting too because they talk about that in the book. The um, the captain talks about that where the book can be your ally, and all of a sudden your yeah. enemy uses it and flips it around on you. So, actually, I had a follow up. Oh, yeah, follow -up. Um, Continuing the uh, sci-fi that was did get interpreted as McCarthyism was EC Comics, mm -hmm. if you're familiar. Yeah, they did many sci-fi ventures about racism, McCarthyism, yeah. you know, xenophobia, and it killed the company. I mean, yeah. they had trials against William Gaines and the publisher, many other publishers as well, burning comics and all that stuff. They blame it a lot on the horror, but a lot of people believe it was the social commentary that the sci-fi was doing. Yeah. Again, a comment, not really a question. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, what year did the comics code start? Gosh, uh, well... 54. 54, we're, 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 yeah, we're okay. We're book in 54, they have the Senate hearings, and then the, yeah. the comics industry decides to self-censor yeah. the, the comics Comic code. code of yeah. 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 Yeah, a direct response to all that. Yeah, good point. 
And it's funny because in Fahrenheit 451, he, I don't know if this was on purpose, but it seems like there was a barb at comic books that comic yes. books were allowed to survive. But yeah. it's funny because the exact same thing's happening where um, during that time, comics apparently had a message that was being shut down because um, because it was causing damage or so they thought. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I thought I don't know if it was an intentional <laughs> barb. Yeah. In other places, in other places, he has been very vocally supportive of comic books and, and comic stuff. So I, I think it was you know, um, that content question probably. Mm-hmm. I would like to thank everyone for coming to this big read panel about Ray Bradbury and its impact on fiction. We'll give, uh, oh, one more comment. I'd like to do really quickly just to, to discuss Ray Bradbury's influence. Um, I, have, I have quotes from three different authors talking about Bradbury, and I, I want to read these really quickly. Um, they're taken from this great book by um, uh, Sam Weller called The Bradbury Chronicles. It's a discussion of his life. It's brilliant. You should totally read it. But he has these great quotes. The first is from Stephen King. He says, well, of course, without Ray, Ray Bradbury, there is no Stephen King, at least as he grew. Bradbury was one of my nurturing influences. I never studied him, I just absorbed what he was up to. Um, And then we have Arthur C. Clarke. I think Ray is one of the most important writers of the 20th century because his books expanded the minds of millions who didn't realize there was more to the universe than one small planet orbiting a second-rate star. Um, And then finally, from Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, she says, when my mother was curious why I was writing stuff about spaceships, I gave her the Martian Chronicles and said, because in science fiction you can do things like this. She read the book, and I didn't have to explain any further. <laughs> so, uh, Bradbury is That's incredibly cool. influential, and I just wanted to get those in there really quickly. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.